Welcome to the last week of the environment, human security, and conflict. Over the last 11 weeks, we have discussed, debated, and written about the most influential explanations for civil conflict and human security risks caused by environmental factors from climate change to food and water insecurity to natural disasters and others. In this week, I wanted to focus on what the international community has done in the face of these large and in some cases existential challenges for people around the world. And in this class, I wanted to just touch on several of arguably the largest and most influential international responses and then discuss a couple of international efforts to grapple with those changes, specifically the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and the Arctic Council, looking at how the uh, international research and government communities have come together to uh, come up with the synth synthesis of the state of knowledge related to these topics that we focused on in this class. And then in the Arctic, uh, grapple with how these changes are having implications for national security, for economic development, for traditional communities, and a whole host of other factors that we've discussed so far this term. So let's go ahead and get started. In the research proposals and in the research that uh, our students are doing for this class more generally, there is an abiding interest and uh, effort at trying to understand the challenges of uh, small Pacific Island states to the kinds of raising sea level rises, weak state uh, challenges that we've talked about in this class. There, is an, there was a, just a conference uh, last month in Palau, called uh, our Oceans uh, Conference. This was the seventh, I believe, the seventh time they've held this conference. The U.S. Uh, co-sponsors it with Palau and is an opportunity for international um, actors, um, activists, and uh, governmental officials like the ones that you see here from the 2019 conference to uh, make commitments to try to address the challenges like those that we've spent the last 11 weeks talking about. And uh, just to connect it to us here in Australia, um, there are a couple of concrete commitments that Australia made back in the 2017 meeting. They meet every two years, so this was from uh, three uh, conferences ago now. Uh, the 2022 conference, the commitments notably weren't written uh, in an easily um, digestible or searchable report. It was uh, YouTube videos that they created of the different representatives making their commitments, as well as... Um, a geocoded map by particular countries that was really not user-friendly in order to understand what the commitments are. Whether that's in purpose or not is outside my knowledge. But getting back to the commitments, the 27 commitments, 2017 commitments, Australia made uh, commitments related to marine pollution, often connecting it uh, to uh, research and gathering better information about it, like this um, funded project around uh, Australian $2 million that CSIRO was going to conduct. There's also uh, F uh, commitments on uh, fisheries. The Australia also, uh, uh, this was more of a foreign aid plan to help um, the countries in the region. This is often a common theme also with uh, climate change more generally as well, that there was um, 29 million US dollars uh, over a number of years towards trying to support countries to adapt and mitigate to the uh, impacts of climate variability, which connects directly to the themes that we talked about uh, last week. So you can see, uh, and if you're interested, you can go on the website and uh, look kind of like with the national adaptation plans that we focused on last week. This is international commitments for developed countries to be able to assist developing countries and developing countries clearly outlining, uh, outlining what plans that they're actually making. And just more generally to take a step back, uh, these kind of efforts by international organizations, the U.S. funding this uh, large conference, other states going and making commitments themselves, uh, this is my way of trying to think about and connect what's actually going on in the world just in, in the time that we've been in this class to the general themes that we've talked about uh, 
this semester. So the motivating question for today, what international responses have been developed to counter the environmental, human security, and conflict challenges that we have analyzed this semester? So in like the Busby reading for this week, they refer to uh, a G7 report that talks about these uh, compound climate fragility risks. And I think that cli uh, compound climate security risks, that doesn't exactly roll off the tongue, but it does connect to one of the overall themes of the course in that a lot of the factors that we might focus on individually in encouraging us to, to study uh, the subjects or to take this class more generally, you will see how there are these interactive effects, these broader feedback loops that can create a potentially a more complicated picture, but a more realistic picture of the challenges that a lot of developing states that we uh, research or that we care about are facing uh, both today in recent history and potentially in the future and connecting it to David Foster Wallace's um, um, encouraging recent graduates of a uh, university in the U.S. to try to understand the water that we all swim in, to try to question our assumptions and take a step back and look at the broader challenges and opportunities that life presents us and to focus less on um, the initial potential impulse in trying to understand it but to to try to understand how others are feeling and that we have some control over how we act there is some agency to either um to better understand it to to take action uh or to understand differing perspectives and challenges that us as individuals and uh the countries in which we live are going to be facing going forward so what are what are those international responses? I think uh, you can classify them in a number of different ways. I think for me, the way that I kind of organize them in level of difficulty, both today and just in my own head, is um, go it alone. This is connecting to basic theories of international relations, right? That you can um, pursue your own policies uh, in individually and focus on domestic mitigation or adaptation efforts. You can... Um, partner up with one other actor through bilateral agreements or treaties to be able to address concerns that might be uh, disproportionately important to uh, the pair of states as, a, as opposed to others in, in the region. Multilateral re, uh, treaties would then bring in other actors more than two to get more comprehensive um, responses or uh, knowledge generation, but that comes with a whole host of issues which we're going to be talking about later. And then there's more systematic international organizations or regimes that have ongoing headquarters, ongoing sources of funding, and can monitor and help enforce commitments that the actors make. The Our Oceans Conference, it is all voluntary. These are verbal commitments in which the, I guess the only significant cost would be potentially reputational with international organizations and regimes. There, there's a, a history and a tradition of having some form of enforcement mechanism to be able to uh, ensure compliance. We can see what the current challenge is in, in Europe right now, the importance of international organizations for security, like with the North Atlantic Treaty Organization or with the UN, with the Security Council, giving venues for states to clearly indicate what their what their interests are and what they're willing to do uh, if other states um, act in ways that they find threaten their own security economic or political security last is um, international norms that there could just be an international response that permeates uh, us as um, a species in which uh, it, it shapes behavior without the necessity of having formal treaties or organizations. It could be uh, uh, more often the norms are the most general. Um, individuals' right to vote, uh, human rights or responsibilities for governments could be considered international norms that even if actors don't share them, they feel like they need to at least respond to them or use the rhetoric of it. Uh, so this is my way that I'm going to approach this this week in trying to look at international responses from the simplest um, individual state acting in their own interest all the way through international norms that just permeate the structure of society to the extent that there really isn't an international organization or treaty that would reflect the entire breadth of it.
more uh, broadly, just to kind of hint at the number of these different uh, international cooperative efforts and how they have increased over the last couple of decades. This shows um, from uh, a database online of the number of different climate initiatives around the world. And you do see the peak here in 2015, another one in 2019, that might have something to do with when major international conferences are held. But it also, I think, is useful to try to compare the last decade or so compared to those in the 1980s or the 1990s, how the climate, the kind of international co coordinated efforts that we're going to focus on today have become increasingly relevant and important, similar to the Busby article that we read for this week talking about how climate security and these complex interactions between human security and national security uh, are driving a lot of the challenges that the international system is, is grappling with uh, now and into the future. So that is the kind of brief overview of what we're going to be uh, touching on today. Um, in the next video, I'm going to be defining my terms that, are going to, that I'm going to be using for the rest of this week, and then areas for cooperation and areas that would be challenging the ability to cooperate and potentially give incentives to use the types of violence that we've seen so far this term. So let's go ahead and turn to that now.